What's up, everybody? Ashley from Recording King here. Thank you so much for watching this Friday. We're here every single Friday bringing you some of the most creative people in music. So if you're interested, click that subscribe button below. We'd love to see you back here every single week. We got a super special treat for you this week. We are live with the amazing Buffalo Nichols. The first song we're going to hear is called Lost and Lonesome. Here it is, Buffalo Nichols. Nichols, what's up, man? Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, how's it going? I'm glad to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what we just heard? Yeah, that song is a song I wrote called Lost and Lonesome. It's a song I've been playing for a while. It was like when I made the decision that I was going to play like the blues, I guess. That was like the first thing that came and it seems people don't hate it, so I, I keep playing it. <laughs> was it one of those things where it was labored over or was it something that just like totally popped out and you're like, here it is, it's perfect in its original form? I don't think I labored over it because I don't actually remember writing it. <laughs> so 
I think it just came pretty easily. It was just like one of those things like messing around with slide and, you know, sometimes the melody just puts words in your head, one of those kind of things. Are you a lyrics lyrics at the same time or do you just like come up with sounds that seem to fit and then kind of try to fit words to that or how do you develop that part of it? I've tried them all and they both worked for me, but um, I would say most of the time the music comes first. But I, I write lyrics all the time, but I'm never able to put them to music usually because I'm trying too hard and it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Well, I know that you have had a really busy past year. This past year has been crazy for everybody, but you've had a lot going on. You moved, you made a record. Tell me what's been going on over the past year. Yeah, I started the year with some really great um, opening slots. I'm just remembering now. It's been a long year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was on the road for a few weeks with um, Robert Randolph. Oh, and yeah. The Drive by Truckers. So that's how I started the year. And that's how I, I was driving back from the last gig with Drive by Truckers when I got the news that um, South by was canceled. And then I was like, okay, I think something's going on here. Yeah. And that was the last gig for a while. So did you immediately go into like huddle mode or were you like, man, what rubbing your hands together to try to figure out what was going on or how are you feeling? I was really nervous because I planned to spend like the rest of the year on the road. So I was like, all right, now I got to like find a home to live in and like <laughs> start doing my laundry regularly. And like, I didn't think that was going to happen. So after like a couple of weeks of panic, I uh, just started writing again. And that was uh, all I could do, really, because there was nothing happening at all, especially in Milwaukee and Wisconsin. Everything was shut down. Yeah. How did you guys deal with it? When I'm imagining in March of last year, it was still pretty cold in Milwaukee. Yeah, it was cold. And it was, I think, like March, April is the time when most Midwesterners are just like so excited to get outside because it's been like seven months of winter. Oh yeah, it's like 20 degrees and dudes are out there in shorts. I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it's pretty difficult. Like you finally think you're gonna get out of this, you know, seasonal depression and then everything stops. Yeah, that's a pretty big bummer. When did you decide to make the move from Milwaukee to Austin? Um, It wasn't really a, that much of a decision. It kind of just happened. I, I went down to Terlingua, Texas to do this artist residency and I had already kind of planned on recording the album in Texas. So once I got down there, I, I initially just went for the residency and to record. But once I was down there, I was like, I can still make money here. You know, as long as I keep my mask on, I'll, <laughs> I'll be all right. And then I just decided to stay. So you never went back to Milwaukee after the residency? I did once to get some, some guitars and some clothes. <laughs> So you got any tips on moving in the middle of a pandemic? Um, yeah, just uh, you got to be able to part with a lot of things. You know? Yeah, yeah. I no, wasn't no, like no. moving my whole life, you know, just like whatever <laughs> I felt was necessary. <laughs> well, so take me back to your childhood. What was your relationship to music when you were growing up? Was there a lot of music in your household as a kid? Were you like really exposed to things at a really young age or did you have to seek it out? Or what, what was your connection to music when you were little? Yeah, there was a lot of music in my childhood, not necessarily like, I don't remember that many instruments or live music, but everyone in my family liked music. My mom always had like a huge collection of CDs and records. My brother was the kind of person who like, you could hear his car coming before he did, like he had the, you know, the stereo system and everything. So like, that was really the beginning for me was also MTV. Like I watched a lot of TV as a as a child, as everyone should. Back when they used to play music. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think like the the tail end of the music days. So a lot of my early music discoveries came from like TRL stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when did you pick up a guitar for the first time? Um, the first time I really picked up a guitar was. I must have been like 11 or 12 years old. My sister, my older sister got a guitar for Christmas and she wouldn't let me play it until like a string broke on it and she decided that she was done. And then I started playing this five string guitar for a while. And I did that for like until I was 12 or 13. And I remember um, 
this was when American Idiot had just come out, mm -hmm. the Green Day album. So I went to Sam Goody and I saw that Les Paul Jr. And I was like, I think I need to play electric guitar. And then the rest is history. As they so what say. was the first electric that you got? It was that, that um, Epiphone Les Paul Jr. Oh man. And you know, I gotta say, I, I put this question a little bit later on in the, in the interview, but I'll, we'll go to it right now, man. You can seriously shred. What, oh, thanks. <laughs> are you like a, a lessons guy? Are you totally self-taught? Like, how did you get those kind of chops going? Um, yeah, I'm self-taught. I just had a lot of free time in my teenage years because I didn't go to class or school that much. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, my real entry into taking music seriously was like punk rock. And by the time I was like, so I started that when I was like 12. And by the time I was 14, I was like, all right, I think I can play all these punk songs. And I was ready to, to move on. And I just got into, into metal, which was like, that's what made me want to just play guitar all the time and started taking it really seriously at that point. Did you play in bands all through of that, like some metal bands, or were you still doing your total own thing or what? Yeah, in my middle school, high school days, I played in, in like a lot of basement metal and punk bands with friends. I love seeing those pictures of people from that time. It's like all hunger, no coolness. At least that's how all of mine were, basically. It's like it's, it's awesome to think back to just kind of the naivete of just rocking out and how fun that is. Yeah, I thought I was so cool with my System of a Down t-shirt. <laughs> I, I was actually, but you know, <laughs> some might disagree. <laughs> so how did you figure out like some of those serious leaks? Were you, I mean, YouTube was not quite a thing at that time. No, it, I think it, it existed maybe towards like my teenage years, but it wasn't like this library of the history of the earth that it is now. <laughs> um, but it was really just like CDs and just listening over and over and over, which I think was helpful to like develop an ear and everything, which because I never bothered to learn to read music. So I think all that suffering over learning songs just, you know, just helped out a lot. So do you have a pretty big repertoire now where you could just be like, sweet, Green Day, I'm going to just whip out seven songs right off the bat. I mean, you could dig deep into your archives and pull some of that stuff out. Yeah, it's been like, you know, I've, I've tried to broaden my palette a lot. So I'd have to go back and like, you know, review to refresh a lot of the stuff. But it's all, I think it's all up there somewhere. Uh, so did you have a certain inflection point where you were like, oh, music, now I see like, this is what I want to be doing with my life? Yeah, I think it was it wasn't in high school because at that point I was just so obsessed that it didn't even it didn't even occur to me that there was going to be a future like everything was like I'm just going to play these songs now I'm going to do this now so I think by the time I my first semester in college which was my only semester in college <laughs> I was like this doesn't really work um and then I was like if I'm not going to do this I got to do something else and I got like a job at a video game store. And I was like, I hate this too, man. <laughs> so I was like, well, it's either music or nothing. <laughs> so <laughs> music kind of, it, it was my only choice, but there was really no other option. You know, it was like, it, it was obvious, but I didn't think about it until I had to, you know. Once you made that decision, did you dive super deep into writing your own songs? Were you mostly playing other people's stuff or, or how did you go about it? Yeah, I kind of gave up on, um, like original music at that point, because up until that point, I was like writing songs and playing with my friends and everything. But once it became a thing that I decided I was going to do for a living, I was just all about getting gigs. So I just became a guitar player around Milwaukee for pretty much anybody who needed one. So I played everything like I played reggae music and African music and pop covers and anything you can Anything you can find in a Milwaukee bar, <laughs> I played. It. Well, what, describe that scene for me. What is the Milwaukee bar scene like? Um, I couldn't tell you what it's like now, but in two thousand and nine, it was uh, it was pretty interesting because it was very like um, insular in a way that people didn't feel like traveling that far. So there would be like eight bars on one street, but and they'd all be packed all the time but with the same people. So you'd like, you know, see the same people, whether I was playing in like an African band or a hip hop band, I'd see the same people every night. So, and I think 
I'm not that far removed from the Milwaukee scene, and I think it's pretty much the same. Like, there's a community that just supports music, and it it changes in size over the years. It gets bigger and smaller, but I think people just like good music in Milwaukee. I think I can say that. Did you feel like it was a good town to be creative in, and it really fed your creative juices? Yeah, I think so. And I always say that like there was never any pressure. Like there was no expectations. Like I want, I need to play this kind of music to be cool or this to do this to get discovered. Like nobody was. There's a lot of talent, definitely, but nobody was like trying so hard that they're like gonna be fake or phony, you know. Well, when did you kind of figure out that you were onto your own thing? You went from kind of all these different types of bands to then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but progressively you made your way to blues and traditional music i got to talk about your voice too man i mean at some time you had to be like whoa this is a pretty awesome sounding instrument meaning your voice it's so gravelly and cool like when did you start to put those pieces together um that was a a lot of different things coming together because basically from the time i started playing guitar till my mid-20s i never i never really sang i just played guitar and it, at some point, I guess it was just kind of unfulfilling. So like when I was like 23, 24, I just quit music altogether and just tried to do other stuff in my life. And and then I realized the important, like the important role that music actually played in my life and how like empty it felt without it. So I went back to it, but I didn't want to be, you know, playing these four hour gigs at bars and I was kind of over that. So that's when I started like writing and taking original music a lot more seriously but singing is still something that i i struggle with because people like you know compliment me on my voice and i appreciate that but it's definitely been work you know a lot of uh whiskey and cigarettes and <laughs> I don't do that I don't either, man. <laughs> it. but i definitely had to work at it you know it wasn't like something that just was obvious or natural to me you know was the transition to a more traditional blues type of thing, something that also came naturally? Or were you just like, hey, I can't help what comes out of me and this is just what it is? Um, it did come naturally, but I, I'd been playing like blues music since I started playing guitar. Like that was one of those things that I discovered in my in my mom's music collection. So I was always listening to that and playing that, but I didn't really see a place for it because, you know, when I was a teenager, I didn't really fully understand the history of it and like the modern context because anytime i would like try to go out and see a blues band it would be like you know a typical chicago blues bar band and i was like i don't really like this i don't like it at all so i was like i guess i'll just keep playing these you know mississippi john hurt songs by myself i didn't see a place for it until i started getting really into like the folk music blues music scene later on when did you feel like other people were starting to pick up on what you were doing? Um, I'll let you know when I feel like <laughs> it. <laughs> but I mean, I guess I could say like, when I like realized that it was something that I could actually just do without, you know, having to distract people with gimmicks or whatever. Um, I think it was uh, after I quit music and I like started traveling a little bit and I started noticing like all around the world, people, mostly outside of America, people like had this certain reverence for the blues as this American art form. And then realizing that like, it's not necessarily gonna be this thing that's gonna pack stadiums, but it's this really impactful art form that you can also make a living off if you want to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, recorded a record while you were in Texas, but still living in Milwaukee. The record is done, but you've still been writing all of this time as well. Tell me a little bit about your process. Yeah, the process is, uh, drives me crazy, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's always the, I guess the pressure to fit all of your ideas into, you know, 30, 45 minutes of music. So, that's that's been my biggest difficulty is like obviously i can't do everything i'm capable of on one record so i'm trying to like be patient and say this is going to be one record and then i'll have more or i can do other things but i also just really like writing music so that to me gives me more joy than anything so 
for me, the process is just like constantly writing down ideas and, you know, taking out the phone, recording leaks and stuff like that. And then um, usually it takes some sort of discipline, like somebody asking for music or like for me to actually put that together into songs, you know, because otherwise just like notebooks and 10 year old voice memos. <laughs> so my, it's kind of chaotic, my process. So do you do you have an idea or an inclination of when something is done or is it just basically like the deadline and you're like as good as I can get it by the time that deadline is here then I'm good you know. Yeah i've been making a conscious effort to be less precious with stuff, because I used to be the kind of person who would like. Just I would record entire albums and just never let anyone hear it and be like no it's not ready it's not done, but now it's almost become a problem where I just like don't care i'm like yeah it's not perfect but. Neither are you. <laughs> so go ahead and take it. <laughs> well, that is the perfect time, I think, to hear another song. Can you tell us a little bit about the one that we're about to hear? Yeah, this song is called How to Love. And this was another one of those things where I'm trying not to be too precious. It was just an exercise in like taking the blues as a musical form and trying to make the lyrics a little bit slightly more mature than you know what people might be used to, but not that much. <laughs>
just want to go back to the creative process one more time. Milwaukee to Austin, how do you think the place where you live or the place where you are, what kind of impact would you say that has on your creativity? It's not a significant one because I, I think a lot of my ideas come from not necessarily, they don't come from my environment. So it's rare that I'll write a song that's a direct reaction to something that I've seen. A lot of things are just more about how I perceive things rather than the things themselves, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I don't leave my house all that much. So <laughs> that hasn't changed. <laughs> are you the main character or is there, are you talking about some generalized person sometimes or are you writing only from experience or what? Um, I try, that's one thing I make a conscious effort is to make sure all of that is uh, unclear to the listener. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's personal experience, sometimes sometimes it's first person, but it's about someone else. Sometimes I'm telling my own stories through the, a different character. So I just try to make it, sometimes I feel like I need to say this is from me to you, but sometimes I need to put some distance, yeah. <laughs> Do you feel some of those more personal songs as you're performing them, it's difficult to go back to those emotional places? Yeah, it's really difficult because I'm still, you know, at a place in my career where most of the time I'm playing to people who don't know who I am. So if I'm like trying to bring up these emotions to give a convincing performance and I'm being like ignored, I get, I get angry. <laughs> my real emotions, people, come on. Yeah, pay attention to me, please. <laughs> So thinking back from the punk days to now, what would you say is like the through line of your creativity that's been a constant throughout all of it? Well, I guess if you put it in those terms, I think the real through line is like a certain kind of uh, just like frustration. I think that's probably my biggest motivator. That's why I was into punk and metal is just like, you know, at the time my simple brain was like, yes, this is the music for angry, sexually frustrated young men this is what <laughs> and that hasn't changed that much but i found it's it totally right totally right <laughs> <laughs> so you're still angry yeah I'm, i mean i'm not an angry person but i think when i sit down and i need to express myself usually the first thing that i need to get out of the way is the anger before i can get to anything else so I, and and you know anger can can come out in a lot of different ways but any kind of anytime I hear music that has like real passion to it, I feel like a connection to it and I try to interpret or like incorporate it. So give me some examples of what you're talking about, something that might be outside of your zone that really has influenced you to kind of find that passion in your own situation. Sure. Well, um, I think like I'm not really a huge, I'm not much of a jazz player. But when I listen to a lot of jazz, especially like bebop stuff, you can hear this like, you can hear the emotion in the in the instruments. Mm -hmm. And I think whenever I'm making music, I'm like thinking about, regardless of genre, I think about these musicians who have been able to put their feelings, you know, truth, truthfully into into the music. I feel like for a lot of that stuff, I'm generalizing, of course, but for a lot of that bebop type of stuff, it's so melodic and sweet sounding, but underneath it, there's like a, I don't know, it, it, there's like a, a pain or an angst or like a mournfulness kind of in some ways, I feel. Slide, yeah. I think also has kind of that same type of vibe. I don't know, do you feel that as well? Yeah, I've always felt like, I, that's kind of the reason why I gravitated to Slide is that you can put so much more emotion into it. You know, you can be a little bit sharp or a little bit flat and then in a way that's like, if you're a little bit sharp and flat in a chord, it's going to sound out of tune, but you can use that a lot more, I think a lot more emotionally, emotively on slide. Yeah. When you're playing, do you feel like you go to that consciously or you're just like, dude, it's happening. I can't, I can't even control it. This is what I'm feeling. That's how I feel lately. Like I can't control it, but that, you know, it wasn't natural because like learning slide, it takes a little bit of time to get comfortable on it. But once you do, once you find like a place that works for you, then it's like, it's like a, you know, second language. Well, I know that you play in a lot of different tunings. So tell me about your live setup. 
what do you what do you bring it with you like do you have a lot of different instruments what describe describe to me your live situation yeah if i can get away with it i like to have an acoustic uh like a dreadnought usually um a banjo and then usually a couple resonators or something with open tunings that i'll use um because i when i play slide i like to have as heavy strings as I can get away with. So that means I gotta stay away from standard tuning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But sometimes I'll take a standard tune and I'll tune it down and it'll be all floppy and weird, but you know, sometimes it works. So are you then, uh, tuning and retuning live? I assume you must be to a certain degree. Yeah, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at it. You know, and I, you know I've become one of those people who can talk and tune at the same time. <laughs> no anxiety inducing, I feel, to just stand up there, particularly in those alternate tunings. It's very, I, 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 that would give me some serious stage fright, I would imagine. Oh, it does, yeah. I always warn the audience because I, I haven't broken a string in probably like on stage in probably like 10 years. You know, it's probably going to happen <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow now. <laughs> but yeah, I, but with all that being said, I try to keep it pretty simple. Like I just I use a preamp. Sometimes I use a, a tremolo pedal but you know because of how much i'm changing tunings and i have to keep in mind which tuning i'm in i try not to have to do too much tap dancing so know. what's your pedal situation right now right now i've got a the grace felix preamp because i like to i like the acoustic sound i try to use a mic whenever i can mm -hmm. and then i don't have an amp right now just because i've been moving around so whenever i go to a venue that has a, a an in-house amp i'll i'll use that that uh, tremolo pedal and plug in plug in my recording king that i got the humbucker on yeah so we talked about that a little bit before the show i'd love to hear a little bit more about that so i sent you an instrument the pickup wasn't quite doing it for you so instead you flipped that out with a more humbuckery style tell me about that really quickly and how you got it mounted and what it sounds like yeah, I just I had one of those uh, slimline humbuckers laying around and I'm a little bit reckless, but careful when it comes to my instruments. So I just drilled a hole in it and I put it in and I prayed and it, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but it sounds great. Like when I use a mic and the humbucker, I get that great like, you know, to me, it's like a lightning Hopkins sound when he has that. You hear the mic and you hear the pickup and so it's got like a little bit of grit hidden in the background kind of yeah that's right yeah yeah i love that man that's awesome so you have been playing what has that been like what have the shows been like is it weird is it super awkward to uh it, obviously you're not wearing a mask are the people who are in the audience wearing masks yeah it's been all across the board sometimes i'm like playing at a restaurant and i'm like i don't think i should be here but i'm <laughs> i'm here anyway <laughs> And those seem a little bit reckless, but um, I've played a few like uh, indoor limited capacity shows, which have been, I th it seems like people, especially earlier on, everybody was just so excited to see music that they were willing to to play by the rules and everybody stayed away from me, which I try to make sure people do normally anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, be, that's, you know, what brought me to Texas is the the laxness of, of it all, which I wasn't happy about, but you know, I'm very grateful that I've been able to, you know, keep playing and make a living. What do you think, uh, as, as it seems like things are starting to open up, at least from what I can see here in Nashville, I, I'm sure that's probably true in Texas. What do you see and what do you have planned for over the next couple of months? Yeah, um, things are slowly, indoor stuff is happening, real venues are opening so very soon i'll be playing to people who aren't eating dinner which i'm <laughs> looking forward to um and then yeah getting back on the road is definitely my goal i've been seeing all the tour date announcements on instagram so i'm getting very anxious so i'm sure that's in the in the near future for me yeah that's great there's nothing you can say now i would imagine but you probably got some some pretty sweet stuff booked i would imagine coming up there's some stuff in the works yeah yeah that's yeah. awesome man well, let me switch channels on you. We have a section of a lightning round. It's called the two by four section. So four questions, two answers to each question. They're super simple. First thing that comes to your mind is the best answer. You ready for the first one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Two favorite things about Austin in 2021 specifically. 
the weather and the social distancing. <laughs> you're 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 really a solo man, huh? Yeah, I I I've come to accept that. That's, you know, that's, that's who when I'm you were talking before, I was thinking like, at some point, do you feel like your music would be great with a band, or are you content to totally just ride it out solo? Or what's your vibe on that? Yeah, I like playing with a band, and I, I definitely will do more of that in the future. So, do you have some people in mind that you would want to work with, or uh, it's still totally up in the air? It, I've got some people in mind, but yeah, I got people in mind, but uh, it's also up in the air, you know, depending on what my music sounds like. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. All right, next question. Two non-music gig essentials. Non-music gig essentials. All right. Um, I always got to bring my own honey from a voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, wow, I'm trying to be quick. I'm just thinking. Uh, it doesn't have to be quick. <laughs> it has to be real. Um, I would say the other one, mm, you know, it's <laughs> it's a uh, Tums or some kind of antacid because I have a tendency to stuff my face before I get you know, burping in the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you can eat before you play. No, I can't, but I do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about the honey thing. What's the, how do you administer it? I just pour it down my throat and or I put it in some hot water or whatever. That's yeah. awesome. All right. Next question. Two favorite things to do outside of music. I like reading and uh, taking care of my plants. That's taking care of my plants. How many plants do you have? Uh, more than I care to say. <laughs> do you have a green thumb or? or uh... No, this has been a pandemic problem that I picked up. Nice. Are you starting to grow anything that you can eat? Like herbs or anything like that? No, I've been thinking about that. But then I realized eventually I'm going to go back on the road. So I don't want to. I don't want to like try to be self-sustaining or anything. It's crazy. <laughs> well, let me touch on the books for a second. What kind of stuff is your go-to when you're picking up something to read? Um, really anything. Lately, I've been into science fiction a lot. I just read the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, whatever it's called, for the first time. Classic, classic. Yeah. That's been a good one. I like short stories and poetry and, you know, I'm not really hooked up or like um, that into the the style or the genre of the author. I'll give anything a chance. And if I want to read after the first chapter, I'll, I'll just keep going. I think like short stories are to me the ultimate form of literature. You have to like be as poetic as if you're writing poetry, but you still have to deliver a full story in that time. I find that stuff so awesome. Are you, you obviously, I'm sure are hip to Ray Bradbury. He's one of my all time favorites. Yeah, yeah, my, definitely. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. All right, one more. Last question. Best two songs to check out for somebody who's interested in learning slide. Okay, let's see. You know, the best two songs to learn for someone. I don't know. I don't think there are there. That's an that's an unanswerable question. <laughs> well, if you were trying to pick up slide and you didn't know what you know now, where would you go to figure out how to get into it? I think, I mean, the reason why that's such a hard question to answer is that everybody's going to have their own way into it. So, I think, like for me, the the, the thing that got me really into slide was. Uh, like I guess transcribing or whatever, like learning other songs on slide, mm -hmm. just familiar familiarizing your own ear with stuff, and um, because I think it can be really intimidating. Like if you listen, if the first slide you hear is like Derek Trucks or something, you're gonna be like, no, nah, no, that's not for me. <laughs> so you know, I just think like you say that, falling in love with the sound is the important thing, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So who are some of the artists that you would recommend? For somebody who's in, not Derek Trucks, obviously, who is sure. awesome. Mm -hmm. I think Blind Willie Johnson is great. And it's like deceptively simple. It can be really hard to like pull off the stuff that he did on record. But I think it gives you a great idea of like what is possible. And Furry Lewis, I think, was, I guess, uh, any like any Furry Lewis song, I think that would be the answer because it's very simple and very like 
he uses it in the way that I love, which is like almost like a background singer or something. Like it's very vocal in the way that he plays. And it's simple enough that you could, you know, pick it up from listening to it. Is all of that stuff in open tunings as well? Yeah, I think most Furry Lewis stuff is, is open D or open G, stuff like that. Dude, open tunings, slide, amazing, amazing. Well, I want to hear one more song if we can. Anything that people should be aware of that you've got coming down the pipeline? The record is recorded. Hopefully it will come out sometime in 2021. I Yes. Hope Hopefully it'll be out this year. Um, and I think if you'll probably hear about it if you if I haven't offended you in this, <laughs> in this <laughs> interview. Yeah. It, um, once that happens, I'll probably be all over the place and you'll be able to see me in real life somewhere. And I'm not as a uh, standoffish as I appear. What's that? I said, I'm not as standoffish as I, as I appear. I'm, oh, dude, dude, whatever, I'm man. We're, I feel like I know you really well now, for sure. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us here. I would love to hear one more song. Can you set it up for us? Yeah, this is a Skip James tune. Um, not traditionally done on slide, but like I said, one of those things, if, if a song feels good, just try it on slide. And it's a dark, sad song, and, and I love it. I'm late. 